Dr. Van Kirkhoff, Global Lead for COVID-19 at the WHO. Thanks very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome uh, to our program. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. All right. Um, this time a year ago, uh, Thailand recorded its first case of uh, COVID-19. And this was the first case that was recorded outside of China. We could not have known at this stage that we were in the midst of a global pandemic unfolding. It's been quite a year for the WHO, perhaps the most difficult uh, in decades, if not a century. Take us through that year, through your eyes, what you saw experienced as technical lead. So that is quite a question, and, and, and indeed it has been it has been quite a year, but not just for WHO, I think for all of us. I don't think any of us had anticipated 2020 would actually turn out the way 2020 turned out. Um, I hope we can get to messages of hope in, the, in this, in this uh, interview because there are many reasons for hope. But if, you, if we look back um, a year ago, um, indeed, you know, there were, the situation was unfolding and what we were starting to see um, you know, was an example of international spread. Um, and so from the beginning of this pandemic, WHO was working through these scenarios, these situations and scenarios in which we thought that something could unfold. And we were working with our partners and we were working to develop, it, to develop advice and guidance to meet each of those types of scenarios. So for example, if it was just a limited outbreak, as most emerging pathogens are, there's usually a cluster and it occurs in a specific location. Um, and then we were working through different types of scenarios where that spread would expand, expand beyond Wuhan and into Hubei, would expand from Hubei into different parts of China, would expand from China to in internationally, perhaps starting regionally, and then looking at transport links and looking more internationally. And we were working through that advice uh, and, and guidance that was needed to be provided to member states. But at this time last year, we had issued our first set of technical guidance um, for all member states and for the and for the public, um, and this included information on how to uh, which which individuals to test, um, how to make sure that those that were testing were collecting the right samples, and that they did so with the right PPE, personal protective equipment, how to care for cases with severe acute respiratory infection. We published a checklist which basically said how ready are you for an emerging respiratory pathogen. Um, we issued guidance around risk communication and community engagement, and we also issued a disease commodity package, which was essentially a list of items that all countries needed to procure um, in terms of any types of medical countermeasures of oxygen or, or masks or PPE, um, as well as types of testing materials. But on this day, one year ago, we also published um, the first PCR assay template. Essentially, it was the recipe for how to develop a PCR test. So this is the molecular test to say who is infected with this novel coronavirus. Um, and that was done less than you know, two weeks after we learned of this cluster of pneumonia. It's really quite incredible to think back um, what had happened within that two week period, but we were anticipating the possibility of spread. And so what we were trying to do was alert the world and alert member states to get ready. And in doing so, providing them with the instructions as best we knew how at the time with the information that we had to get everybody ready. But it was, it was an incredibly fast, focused, um, it was a professional calm, but focused. So, you know, people weren't running around not knowing what to do. We have a structure in place. We have an emergency management um, structure. So everyone knew what to do. Everyone knew what their role was and how it fed into a global response or the potential for it to become a global response. The year unfolded in a way that I don't think any of us had anticipated. I could probably spend the next three hours talking with you about how that has unfolded, but it's been um, marked by collaboration, um, by drive, by science, um, by adaptation, um, being agile to make sure that we have a response that fit for purpose, um, knowing the challenges that, that, that lie ahead. So it's been an intense year, the most intense year of my, of my life. I think of all of our lives for various reasons and, and all of us have been impacted either directly or indirectly um, by this virus. Uh, so it's been a tough year. 
So where are we now? What's the global picture? Um, we've seen waves, we've seen uh, the count, the infections, the sadly the deaths reported. As a journalist, this is the story that we've told every single day for, for the last year. Yeah. Where would you say we are now globally? Um, I mean, when we look at countries like China, it, some countries have done really well. And I guess there's a lot of countries still struggling. Yeah, the, the global picture is mixed. Um, we have seen many countries bring COVID under control. Um, you know, they have transmission down to such a low level. And in some countries, um, they've been able to eliminate uh, transmission. There's always a threat of, of reimportation from travelers. Um, but they've put in a comprehensive system of finding cases, cluster investigation, isolation of cases, isolation and clinical care of cases, um, supported quarantine of contacts, uh, namely outside of the home, but even within the home to make sure that people are quarantined away from their loved ones so that they remain physic <clears throat> excuse me, physically distant yet socially connected. Um, they've applied all of the individual level measures, the hand hygiene, the mask wearing, the physical distance, the respiratory etiquette, um, and ensuring that communities are engaged and formed. And, and also, I think countries that have done well are countries that have had experience with other similar pathogens. Um, like SARS coronavirus, like MERS coronavirus, like Ebola, like measles and yellow fever. I mean, the world uh, needs to learn a lot from each other, including the incredible work across Africa. Um, highly diverse, many different countries should never be lumped together like many people say, just Africa, which is incredibly dynamic um, and hardworking. And you have shown the way uh, to many others how to do this because you have collective experience of dealing with infectious diseases. You've put in the efforts to build community-based systems so that you have workers, a workforce, a trained and educated and informed and empowered workforce um, that can help with contact tracing and can help with door-to-door -door checking in on individuals, um, building uh, facilities where facilities are needed, repurposing other facilities um, as necessary um, providing appropriate clinical care um, with dexamethasone, which is a drug that is widely available, that is inexpensive, um, that saves lives. Um, and so I think, you know, many countries are mixed. On the other hand, we have a number of countries that are really under intense transmission, and they have had peak after peak or surge after surge after surge. Um, and I think there are reasons for that in terms of their approach um, and in terms of a consistency or lack of consistency in, in applying the measures that are needed. Um, there's a middle ground. We have some countries that have had pretty big peaks and brought transmission under control into single digits and now are seeing incredible surges again. Um, and it's about finding that balance with the right levels of interventions while opening up your society. We've seen a fluctuation between open and closed and there's no dichotomy here anymore. It isn't a yet, there's none of, none of these answers are yes or no, do this or don't do this. There's a, there's a broad mix of how these different interventions and combinations of interventions need to be applied. And the variants that are being detected in a number of countries are not helping matters. Um, South Africa has been a leader in showing uh, how to apply science and a rigorous approach to surveillance and sequencing and analysis and letting the data drive the actions. So the work coming out of South Africa with colleagues is is incredibly impressive. And we're so grateful to have many South Africans as partners um, in, 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 all of our, in all of our networks. Um, yeah, the story of the continent is that, uh, yeah, uh, we try to do the cooperation things, but we are differently resourced. And I just wonder, do we actually know the size of the problem on the continent? Uh, because testing levels are very different. Uh, mainly rural communities. So some of them may just get sick and they don't know that this is COVID-19. Um, does that make a difference in managing the pandemic? It does. Um, I, I think we're certainly underestimating the numbers of cases and deaths associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection and COVID-19, the disease caused by that virus. But I think that's true across all continents, uh, quite frankly. Um, one of the things we look for is the testing strategies that are in countries. 
and the strategic use of testing linked to public health action. I think the latter part of your question is the main point is if somebody were to be infected with this virus, what does that mean for them and what do they need to do um, in terms of the care that they would need, um, in terms of the isolation that would need to happen for them to prevent onward spread, uh, contact tracing to make sure that those that came in contact with them are, are in quarantine so that they, if they are infected, they don't further spread it. Um, but if we look at the seroprevalence surveys that are conducted around the world, and there are many that, are, are, that have been published from Africa, um, and many that are underway, and, and many countries are working directly with WHO as part of our unity studies, um, where um, you're using some protocols that have been developed, a standardized approach. And if we look at the results from the seroprevalence studies across Africa, they're actually similar to the results we've seen in many other countries. So depending on the study under population, uh, the, the population under study, excuse me, um, the seroprevalence is, of that population is less than 10%. With the exception of health workers, frontline workers, essential workers that tend to have a higher seroprevalence. That's a similar pattern um, that we've seen in other countries on other continents. So we're, those are not necessarily asymptomatic cases, but those are unrecognized cases by the current surveillance system. So I think there's no doubt um, that we're missing the extent of, of, the, of the problem. Um, but I think that with increased surveillance activities and with um, making sure that we leverage um, existing systems. We are smart with the resources that we have. Um, you know, we can utilize the resources to the best of our ability and really make best use of them for public health purposes. All right, so um, we're getting into the vaccine era now and uh, some countries have already started to uh, deploy. Uh, I guess in many ways, this could be one of the most difficult phases partly because of the expectation and um, just making sure that people A, have faith in the vaccines and B, that they work as hoped um, and getting it out there. This, this must be the next most challenging phase of this journey. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's the expectation. I mean, there's a lot of work that's underway for the development of safe and effective vaccines. And it's an incredible scientific feat to have multiple safe and effective vaccines that are coming online now. Um, it's another thing entirely to produce them at scale. And it's another thing entirely to make sure that countries have access to these vaccines. Um, with that, as you know, we're working through COVAX um, to make sure that there's a fair and equitable distribution of these vaccines. And then working with countries to make sure that there are vaccination plans um, so that a vaccine can enter into someone's arm and actually provide the protection that they're, they're set to do. But this is happening at a slower pace than everybody would like. There's no question about that. Um, and I think the expectation, and I think everyone's mental fatigue from the pandemic and the excitement of the vaccine is not quite matched. So it will take some time for these vaccines to be rolled out. Um, we're working very hard to ensure that Vaccines, safe and effective vaccines are available for those most at risk in all countries, as opposed to having the vaccine available for all people in a couple of countries. But now is the time where we, we challenge the rhetoric into action um, and we call on global solidarity to be able to do so. Um, but I think it will take some time for us to get to the point where vaccines have a measured impact on uh, morbidity, mortality and on transmission. And in the meantime, we have, to, we have to hold on tight and remain determined to do all of the individual level actions that we can that keep us and our loved ones safe. Talking about individual level actions, I, I'm sure that it must be a concern that people are starting to think it's over and that it's done and when we still have quite a journey so that so much can still happen, I guess. Yes, we, we have a long way to go. Um, and we need to stay the course. And um, I think what we are seeing in, in some countries is that people are finding ways to incorporate these actions into their daily life. Behavior change is not something that happens overnight. Behavior change is something that happens gradually and, it, and it's, it's worked in, it's weaved into our daily steps, if you will. Um, and we need everyone to realize that this is not over. It's far from over. It still is a dangerous virus. Even these variants are, are dangerous. Um, but the wild type virus is dangerous itself too. And if we can incorporate 
a risk-based approach into our actions every day. What is it that I need to do today? What is it that I have to do today? What is it that I can postpone? And there's a big difference between doing things we want to do compared to doing things we have to do. Um, and we need everyone to participate in this global fight. So if there are things that you can do from home, if you can work from home, work from home. If your employer supports that, work from home. Because many people cannot do that. And if we can alleviate some of the pressure on some of the transport systems, on you know, people's ability to get in and out of work, um, we, could, we could create space for people. One of the most important things we can still do right now is physical distancing. The wearing of the masks adds to that. The hand hygiene adds to our protection. Opening of windows and avoiding crowded spaces adds to our protection. Um, but we have to weave all of these different actions every day. And we do need to be conscious about our social mixing. Uh, countries that are really in um, some terrible situations right now with exponential growth, um, most of that is because of mixing of families and for socializing. Um, and that right now, it's just not time. It's just not the time to give up. We can't lose this. We can't lose this right now. You know, we work so hard. We have vaccines coming online. Um, we can do this. And I think we need everyone to kind of have that mental, that mentality of like, we can do this. We can get through this. I will be a broken record every time someone gives me an opportunity to speak about this because people need to feel that they have some control over this terrible situation that we're all in. Yeah. And I, I know that uh, global cooperation has been the big theme uh, this uh, past year. And I know that uh, global scientists got together this uh, past week for the WHO R&D blueprint. What came through in that gathering and what does it point to going forward? Well, it was a great meeting that we had yesterday. Um, with the R&D Research and Development Blueprint for Epidemics. Um, and this, the, the R&D Blueprint for Epidemics was established several years ago, focusing on high threat pathogens. What are the pathogens that have that potential pandemic risk? And what do we need to do to prepare for that in terms of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines? Yesterday, we met to discuss a research agenda for these virus variants that are being detected and reported. And it was bringing together, I think there were more than 1,700 people that registered for the meeting participated from, I think, more than 120 countries. So it was open in the sense to have this dialogue of bringing people together to say, okay, we know we need to do 100 things, but let's prioritize our work. Let's come together and collaborate and have a framework in which we can get the work done that needs to get done to determine which of these mutations and variants are important, um, which ones are should be under investigation for more studies, which ones from that investigation become variants of concern? And what does that mean for public health? What does that mean for diagnostics and vaccines and therapeutics? We have a number of variants that have been reported from the United Kingdom, from South Africa, from Denmark. Um, there was one that was reported from Japan. We have some from Brazil. There will be more. There will be many more variants that will be identified because that's what viruses do, they change. But we need a robust system in place to study them. So the groups met to discuss critical research on epi and modeling, on animal model studies, on evolutionary biology, on therapeutics, on vaccines and diagnostics. Um, there will be a report that will come out, so we'll make sure that you have a copy of that, which summarize um, the discussions. But it's one of many meetings that WHO has. Um, you know, one of the superpowers, as I think I like to call it, that WHO has is our convening power in bringing together scientists and bringing together public health uh, researchers, public health professionals, frontline workers to exchange information and share uh, what we what we are learning, and then move that, drive the research, drive the policy forward um, to help everyone. All our whole collective goal is to make sure we prevent as many infections and save as many lives as we can. All right. I mean, talking about uh, uh, learning, um, have we through COVID nineteen? Um, prepared ourselves, do you think, well uh, for what might come next? Because I guess these are things that will visit humanity from time to time. Well, I think we're getting there. Um, I think we need to see the investment in public health, uh, investment in primary care and universal health coverage. I mean, prevention is so much better than response um, in terms of, of public health uh, impact. Um, Countries, like I mentioned earlier, countries that have had a trauma from dealing with other pathogens like SARS, MERS, Ebola, yellow fever, um, put that trauma to good 
use in the sense where they used it to actually make change in the country. I am hopeful that countries that have gone through this horrible year and now into this into the second year, that trauma um, to good use and actually making sure that they invest in preparedness and we invest in the systems that are in place to rapidly you know, monitor these viruses um, that have the potential to spill over from animals to humans and then rapidly detect and work together. Um, but we, we are certainly more prepared than we were a year ago, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and I think everyone appreciates that this will not be the last event like this. Um, we're all hopeful that we won't have to go through something like this again, but we should be prepared for it to happen. Um, so I'm hopeful that people, will use, countries will use this trauma, this horrible situation for, for a positive and make sure we invest in preparedness.